Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, we'll be looking at the new adaptation of the beloved Stephen King novel, Pet Cemetery, where a family moves to a rural main town, discovering a mysterious burial ground that leads to a perilous chain reaction that unleashes an unspeakable evil with horrific consequences. The tradition of adapting horror legend Stephen King's books to the big screen has been going strong for quite some time now, about 40 years or so. And perhaps now is even more ubiquitous than ever, especially after the huge success of It, it's no surprise that many of King's classics are being adapted anew, redesigned for modern audiences, which is definitely the case with Pet Cemetery. We already have an original 80s version as well as a sequel, but the original came out in 1989, literally 30 years ago. So it does make sense to dust off the cobwebs for a new adaptation. What the new Pet Cemetery has going for it is that the original isn't very good. While it does have a lovely sheen of cheesy 80s goodness with some incomparable highlights like Fred Gwynn aka Herman Munster's legendary performance as Judd or the extremely frightening meningitis afflicted Zelda, the look of which is the stuff of nightmares, as well as the unforgettable, weird, hilarious, and downright bizarre final showdown with a resurrected Gage wearing a dandy little suit and wielding a scalpel. Also the unforgettable in credits title song by the Ramones, apparently King is a fan. Just love how in especially the 80s every movie needed its own title. Tune. That's all the kind of stuff that sticks with you for a lifetime and makes the 89 version a classic in its own right. Yet it does feel especially dated. And other than the old man and the three year old, the acting is shaky at best, especially from our lead. So this is one case where I'm actually glad to be getting a new adaptation. One that could really tap into the horror and fear of the story and deliver some big scares and truly frightening moments. Overall, I'd say the new adaptation is superior to the original, just better crafted and executed. Also being aware of the audience's expectations and occasionally subverting them. The biggest example being the switch from Gage in the original story to Ellie being the one killed here, which was already spoiled in the trailers. Definitely would have been better to have this be a surprise in the theater. My major complaint is that it still left me wanting more than what we were given. Despite some changes, things play out as expected, and I really wish they had pushed things further into a new, different direction, as well as the horror and gore, which was surprisingly a lot tamer than I would have thought, especially coming from the directors of Starry Eyes, which had some wonderfully unsettling body horror. So I still enjoyed it, but it didn't quite reach the heights or push the envelope nearly as much as I wanted. So maybe you've seen the movie and still have some questions, especially if you haven't read the book, as many important aspects to the story are relegated to the background, including what is behind the evil force that surrounds the cursed burial grounds. So let's check out the new Pet Cemetery, breaking down the movie, everything you might have missed that fills in the bigger picture, comparing the major changes in the new adaptation to the original, and explaining the ending that is also quite different than what we would anticipate. Our story begins with the Creed family, leaving behind the hustle and bustle of living in Boston. For the simple small town of Ludlow, Maine. But since this is Stephen King's Maine, literally every inch of it is covered in evil in some form. Though initially, the family seems content with their change. Until the evil begins to seep into their lives. When daughter Ellie spots a group of creepy children in a procession wearing animal masks, carrying a dead dog in a wheelbarrow, she decides to follow, coming across a makeshift pet cemetery, misspelled as we know, with one side barricaded by a deadfall of branches and debris into a high wall. Ellie tries to ascend it, stopped in her tracks by a bee sting. Luckily, their neighbor, the grizzled Judd Crandall, comes to the rescue, tending to her sting, and the two seem to form an instant bond. Though things turn serious when Judd warns her about the woods being dangerous and tells her to never venture out there alone. This experience brings Ellie to consider questions about life and death, like why do animals not live as long as humans, and in particular, about what happens after we die. Father Lewis has a cold clinical perspective, that our metabolism simply runs out of over time and that death is all there is, while mom Rachel feels otherwise, hopeful that there is more to life after we shuffle off this moral coil, and more or less refuses to even broach the subject of death with her daughter. This is due to her own personal experience with death as a child, having to watch her sister Zelda, who 
suffered from spinal meningitis get progressively worse over time, Rachel eventually becoming frightened of her appearance and threatening behavior. The night that she died, only Rachel was there to take care of her, but not wanting to see her, sent up her dinner through a dumbwaiter, which her parents expressly told her not to use. Sending up the meal, the waiter begins to come down, with Zelda inside, but not able to handle her weight, it breaks, sending Zelda plummeting down the shaft to her death. Due to this, Rachel feels responsible in a way for her sister's death, and feels even guiltier because she actually wanted her to die so she wouldn't have to be afraid of her anymore. So we see why she has a strong aversion towards death, or even discussing it at all with her daughter. Later, Lewis gets his first indication of the dark forces in the area. Working as a doctor, usually dealing with trivial injuries, is shocked when a mangled car crash victim, Victor, is brought in. Despite Lewis doing his best to save him, the student quickly passes from his injuries, only to somehow come back to life to give Lewis a warning. Don't break the barriers between worlds. Hmm, good advice. But just as suddenly his body returns to normal, as in definitely dead. Well, he could have just been seeing things. That is, until he has a vivid dream later featuring Victor, who leads Lewis to the cemetery, warning him not to venture beyond the deadfall. Or perhaps it wasn't a dream at all. Lewis waking up the next morning and disturbed to find dirt on his feet and the sheets, indicating that his late night trek to the woods actually did occur. Though it's not until appropriately enough on Halloween that things take a darker turn. When their poor cat Church is killed by one of the never-ending semis constantly barreling down the road behind their house. Probably not a good idea to have kids with a road of death right behind them, but whatever. Expressing concern over what Ellie's reaction would be to Church's death, Judd suggests they bury him at the pet cemetery and merely tell Ellie that he ran away. As to them, it's better to still completely avoid the concept of death at all in their daughter's life. But rather than bury the kitty at the cemetery, Judd guides them deeper into the woods, climbing over the deadfall and entering into a foggy filled area known as Little God Swamp, which is actually an ancient burial ground that was used by the Mi'kmaq Indians. Unaware of the repercussions, they bury Church at the grounds. The next day, about to explain to Ellie that he ran away, surprisingly, her beloved cat has returned, though looking much more mangy and acting a lot more aggressively than before. Obviously, burying the cat at the cursed ground has brought it back to life, but now embodied with evil, scratching Ellie and tearing a bird to shreds on their bed. A confused Lewis confronts Judd about what they did, and he tells them about the power of the land to bring back the dead, the town believing that the area is inhabited by the spirit of a Wendigo. From Native American folklore, the Wendigo is a mythical man-eating creature with some human-like characteristics, or alternatively is a spirit that possesses humans and makes them more monstrous. The Wendigo is what is actually responsible for the evil in the woods, and has been here for many years, as it is what cursed the burial ground, forcing the Mi'kmaq Indians to abandon the area and resettle elsewhere. And it was lurking in the background as the town of Ludlow was created, manipulating events throughout its history, similar to Pennywise in the nearby town of Derry. Man, Maine sure is fucked, according to Stephen King. Both film adaptations regulate the creature to a background presence, distant growls and cracking branches amongst the trees. But it is, as we can see, actually extremely important to understanding what is behind the evil going on in Ludlow. So in the case of Church or others the Wendigo brings back, they are actually possessed by its malevolent spirit, which is responsible for their aggressive, murderous behavior. The situation becomes severe enough for Lewis to take action, deciding to try and euthanize a zombie cat, but he can't bring himself to do it, instead driving him far away and dropping him off, hoping that's the end of it. Oh. Done and done. But of course it's not. He's already brought the evil into his life by burying Church, and is not about to give up on the Creed family. Throwing a birthday party to cheer Ellie up, she spots Church in the road, running to get him, as Gage stumbles after her. They really play up this moment, making us unsure of the outcome. Too bad it was spoiled in the trailer, and we know that Lewis snatches up Gage and is rescued, while Ellie suffers his fate of the original. The truck swerving after narrowly missing Gage, the back tank coming loose and sliding down the road, slamming right into Ellie flinging her into oblivion. And while the impact killed her, it had surprisingly little physical impact. I'm picturing this huge semi-tank coming at you at full speed and what the impact would be like. Smoosh! You'd think it'd be like a blood bag exploding or something, but nope, just tossed her away, I guess. The family is, of course, heartbroken over losing Ellie, especially Rachel, still dealing with issues related to her sister and can't handle being at the house anymore, taking Gage to stay at her parents for a while, leaving Lewis all alone with his overwhelming grief. And sensing what his plan might be, Judd discourages him from burying Ellie at the cursed crown, telling him that sometimes dead is better, and recounts his own experience with the swamp, told about it by another local. Judd buried his own dog there, who came back mean and uncontrollable 
people just as with church. So then the question becomes, why did Judd take Lewis to bury church in the first place if he knew what would happen? There's some element of not wanting Ellie to be hurt by losing her cat, but also his dog was already mean before being buried and hoped that church might be different. But the real reason is that the grounds have a kind of pull on people that venture there. By visiting the swamp at all, you become kind of entranced by the area, wanting to return to it despite knowing better. The same idea of Judd taking him there in the first place. He really did hope it might be different this time, even though he already knew the likely outcome. This pull, in addition to, of course, the difficulty of losing his daughter, helps us understand why Lewis continues with his ill-advised plan, drugging Jug, then exhuming Ellie's body and reburying it at the cursed grounds. And I'm not 100% sure, but I do think we catch a glimpse of the Wendigo watching over them in the woods. It was hard to make out in the theater, but it sure looked like something was out there overseeing the scene. As expected, Ellie is soon resurrected, returning home, seemingly unaware of the fact that she died, only remembering getting hit by the tank and things going black. Though she initially seems less erratic than changed by her return, she soon manifests similar traits to church. No longer the sweet and friendly girl, but now disturbing and cold. Later telling her dad he was wrong about there being nothing after death. That there is somewhere she went, saying that it was only darkness. Well, that's pretty bleak, Ellie. Thanks a lot. Meanwhile, back at her parents' house, we see that the evil has attached itself onto Rachel and Gage, even outside of Ludlow. Gage seeing Victor, while Rachel is plagued by visions of her sister. Her unable to reach Lewis, she grows increasingly concerned, deciding to head back to him, on the way calling Judd to try to check in. Judd finds Lewis cagey and avoidant, telling him that everything is fine. But he knows better when spotting Ellie looking down from the upstairs window, knowing Lewis didn't heed his advice. Horrified, he returns home to grab a gun to kill Ellie, and the girl turns on her old friend. Church distracting him, and using one of her father's scalpels, slices Judd's Achilles heel. Standing over him, Ellie's face changes to that of Judd's dead wife, Norma, saying that she, like Ellie, will also be suffering for eternity thanks to him, implying that he had also buried his wife at the cemetery and already gone through the same exact situation as with Ellie prior, though presumably having to kill his reanimated wife, further showing us how much sway the cursed grounds have over people that have been there. He knew the whole time the Creed family were doomed, yet still led them right to their demises, ultimately leading to his own at Ellie's hands, a kind of comeuppance for his responsibility in their fates. Though no one knows Ellie has killed Judd, returning home undetected as Rachel and Gage arrive, reintroducing herself to them without a second thought, though her mother is clearly shocked and disturbed seeing Ellie alive again, realizing what Lewis has done and fleeing upstairs with Gage. He tries in vain to get her on board with their zombie child, then realizing that she's vanished, rushes over to Judd's house and discovers his body, leaving a perfect opportunity for Ellie to attack, Rachel getting stabbed but escaping to the bathroom, attempting to carefully lower Gage from the second story window, Lewis showing up just in time to catch him. However, Rachel is distracted, Ellie stabbing her in the back, brutally goading her about her sister and the real Ellie being gone before finishing her off with a series of calculated stabs deep in the gut. Dang. Cold, bitch! Cold! Getting Gage in the car, locking him in and telling him not to open the door for anyone, Lewis rushes into the house, discovering his dying wife, who pleads with him not to bury her in the cemetery. But that won't stop Ellie, who knocks Lewis unconscious, then dragging her parents all the way to the cursed spot, there burying her mother. Later, Lewis regains consciousness, finding Ellie in the woods, leading to a fight between the two. He eventually gets the upper hand, knocking her down to the dirt, and lifting a shovel into the air, just about to decapitate her, a steel pole rips through his body from behind, coming out the other side. That's right, Rachel is back. And with very good timing. Well, very bad for Lewis, who now dead is also buried. Soon after being resurrected, and the zombie family joined together, set fire to Judd's house, before coming to the car where little Gage is still locked up inside. Church pounces on the hood, eyeing him hungrily, as his father comes to the window, beckoning him to unlock the door. This final shot of the undead family coming up was actually quite haunting, and also a quite downbeat note to end on, with assumedly Gage joining the others. In the end, none of the family survived. Which leaves me wondering, okay, now that they're all zombies, what the heck are they going to do now? Just keep bringing others to the cemetery, I guess, to kind of continue the spread of evil further into the world outside of the swamp? I don't know. The novel clearly states the reanimated bodies live for 10 years, and that would be a lot of time to be out there killing and burying people. Could wind up with a whole town of zombies before too long. Which brings up an interesting idea that is kind of hinted at, but not really seen. The possibility that there are already other undead people or animals 
out there. This in particular ties to those kids in the masks. They only appear in one scene and we don't see what they do with their dead dog, possibly just burying it in the front cemetery. But it's also entirely possible that they actually took it to the burial ground knowing full well what would happen, as there's a shot from a cutscene showing the kids at what certainly looks like the area past the deadfall. And it stands to reason that Judd wouldn't be the only one aware of what it can do, especially if it's been part of the town's history for generations. These questions are new for this adaptation of the book, which the 89 version adhered to in the end, both having a substantially different outcome than the new version. There, instead of being unable to euthanize Church, Lewis does follow through with his morphine injection, killing the evil cat for good. Then when confronting Gage in his adorable little suit, Lewis kills him with the same injections. Though Gage still kills Rachel, this time it's Lewis once again left alone, as Ellie does not return with Rachel from her parents, and clearly not learning his lesson so far, as well as the sway of the grounds overwhelming Lewis, he convinces himself this time will be different with Rachel, feeling he waited too long to bury the others. If he buries her quickly, perhaps she won't be evil. He's wrong, of course, waiting patiently for Rachel to return. The two reunited and embracing, sharing an extra gooey kiss as Rachel picks up a knife about to kill Lewis, ending with this kind of cliffhanger. This outcome is much more conclusive and closed feeling than the new incarnation, which also takes a different direction with zombie Ellie being the one to bury her mom to bring her back. The resurrected here is seeming to have the specific drive or purpose of creating more like it, rather than just killing for killing sakes as it was in the original. Also, as I mentioned in the original, Ellie doesn't return from her mom's parents and is spared from the slangs that befall the rest of her family. The original sequel concept for A Pet Cemetery 2 would have followed a now adult Ellie learning about her past and no doubt tangling with the evil all over again. Of course, what we actually got with Pet Cemetery 2 was drastically different than this original idea, yet still appealing in its very silly and own bizarre kind of way. Well, that about wraps it up for this ending explain on Pet Cemetery. It is well done and overall still superior to the 89 version and successfully updates the horror for modern sensibilities. However, I still wish it had done more in that regard and really amped up the scares and even the gore. The initial scene with Victor was gruesome, boasting some unsettling, wonderful practical effects. And I honestly thought that this was just a taste of things to come, but it weirdly was much tamer after this than I would have anticipated in every aspect. I also did appreciate the few different twists it took on the original material, though it overall still stuck very closely to the book. And I actually wish that it would have also done some more surprising things with the story. Because if you've read the book or seen the previous movie, things unfold pretty much as expected. Regardless, I understand that this is designed for a new modern audience, and the new adaptation stands up better than most as being a worthy new addition to the increasing pantheon of Stephen King big screen adaptations. What did you guys think of Pet Cemetery and its ending? What did you think of the changes they made to the story and conclusion? What's your favorite Stephen King movie? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.